dive into the chilling depths of true crime history with obscure chronicles of serial killers. In this thought-provoking video, we unearth the stories of lesser-known serial killers whose sinister deeds have often been overshadowed by more notorious cases. Join us on a journey through the shadows as we shed light on the forgotten horrors that gripped communities and eluded mainstream attention. Dayton Rogers Rogers was convicted in 1989 of killing six women two years earlier. Since then, the court has three times struck down death sentences imposed on him. On Friday, his attorneys in closing statements asked for the jury to grant him life in prison, saying Rogers is humiliated and full of shame and that he is not a danger to people in prison. The prosecution had asked for the death penalty, saying Rogers is a danger to people both inside and outside of prison, and that his victims and their families deserve justice. Prosecutors pointed out that the former Canby lawnmower repairman tortured, stabbed, and mutilated his victims, dumping them in a forest near Malala in Clackamas County. Seven victims were found at that site. One of them was finally identified in 2013. Before that murder case, he was also found guilty of murdering a woman whose body was found in 1987 in the parking lot behind an Oak Grove Denny's restaurant. The Oregon Supreme Court struck down Rogers' death sentences in 1992, 2000, and 2012. The first time was to comply with a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that invalidated Oregon's death penalty law. In 2000, the Oregon High Court ruled that the jury incorrectly considered only the options of death and life in prison with the possibility of parole. There should have been a third choice, life without the chance of parole. In 2012, the justices said jury selection was done improperly and the judge incorrectly allowed evidence of Rogers' gay experiences as a teenager. Though it is rare to have four separate sentencing trials, it's not unprecedented. For example, Randy Lee Kuzik was sentenced to death three times for killing a Central Oregon couple in 1987, and each time the penalty was overturned. A jury imposed it for a fourth time in 2010, and it has stuck. Rogers' first known attack was at age 18 in 1972, when he stabbed a 15-year-old Eugene girl after taking her to a wooded area to have sex. In 1973, after striking two girls with a soda bottle, he was sent to the state mental hospital. After his release in 1974, Rogers' crimes continued for more than a decade. At his 2006 sentencing trial, Rogers argued that he was changed a man after nearly two decades in prison. There is never a day that I don't struggle from the very core of my heart and soul over the despicable acts I've committed, Rogers said. After the latest court proceedings, Rogers' attorneys said they planned to file a motion for a mistrial based on a violation of jury rules. They claimed that the jury foreman posted on social media about the trial. Blog posts were entered into evidence and a judge will decide on a retrial at a later date once the motion is filed. That could mean Rogers would go up for his fourth appeal. Governor Kate Brown announced shortly after taking office early this year that she will continue former Governor John Kitzhaber's moratorium on the death penalty in Oregon. On Saturday, spokeswoman Kristen Granger said, Governor Brown has asked her general counsel to consult various experts, including those directly involved with the implementation of the death penalty in Oregon, and advise her how to proceed. That process is underway. Governor Kate Brown commutes the sentences of all 17 people on Oregon's death row in December 2022. William Reese a jury in Oklahoma has recommended a death sentence for an alleged serial killer who was convicted of kidnapping a woman from a car wash and killing her more than 20 years ago. The jury on Wednesday recommended the death penalty for William Lewis Reese, who was convicted last week of first-degree murder for the 1997 kidnapping and killing of 19-year-old Tiffany Johnston. Formal sentencing is set for August 19. Reese did not testify at his trial but the jury heard recordings of his confessions to police in which he admitted killing Johnston and three other people in Texas, the Oklahoman reported. Johnston, 20-year-old Kelly Cox, 17-year-old Jessica Kane and 12-year-old Laura Smither all disappeared over a four-month period in 1997, after Reese had been released from an Oklahoma prison for previous rape and kidnapping convictions. Smither's body was found shortly after her disappearance, but the remains of Kane and Cox weren't found until 2016, 
when Reese began cooperating with prosecutors. We're all so happy that he got the death penalty, said Johnston's mother, Kathy Daubry. Even though it helped families in Texas, it was for Tiffany, she said of the verdict. After 24 years and 10 months, this is Tiffany's time. Reese's defense attorney, Jacob Benedict, did not dispute that Reese killed Johnston, but said his client only confessed because a Texas Ranger had promised that prosecutors wouldn't seek the death penalty. A promise he couldn't keep, but still a promise, Benedict said. Gay Smither, the mother of 12-year-old Laura Smither, traveled to Oklahoma for the trial, Houston TV station KPRC reported. Reese still faces charges for her daughter's death in Texas. If we don't have our day in court in Galveston, we can live with it because he's at least held accountable here, she said. The most important thing is we know now for sure there is absolutely no way this man will ever get out. William Reese sentenced to death. Admitted serial killer William Lewis Reese had one last opportunity to apologize directly to the family of the newlywed he abducted from a Bethany car wash and strangled to death in 1997. He stayed silent. No, he said loudly behind a mask when the judge asked him if he wanted to say something. There's an old saying in the law, justice delayed is justice denied, Oklahoma County District Judge Susan Stallings then told him. Justice will not be delayed any longer in this case. I sentence you to death. A jury in June decided Reese, 62, should be executed for the murder of Tiffany Johnston. He showed no emotion as the judge sentenced him Thursday morning. He will appeal, his defense attorney announced. He never testified at his trial, but jurors heard hours of his confessions to the killing in Oklahoma and three in Texas in 1997. The victims were all females, the youngest 12. He's not sorry, Johnston's mother, Kathy Daubry, of Anadarko, said after the 15-minute formal sentencing. He's just a serial killer. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. She also said she will never forgive him. Never. I'm sorry, Daubry said. I believe in God and all that but I will never forgive him. And I'm glad people can but not this mama. Reese began confessing in 2016 from a Texas prison after being linked to the Oklahoma cold case by his DNA. He eventually revealed where in Texas he buried two bodies with bulldozers. He admitted to first killing Laura Smither, 12, in the Houston suburb of Friendswood. Smither disappeared on April 3, 1997, while jogging. Her body was found later that month in a retention pond. He next killed Kelly Cox, a 20-year-old student at the University of North Texas in Denton. She disappeared on July 15, 1997, after going on a class field trip and locking herself out of her car. Her remains were found at a rice field south of Houston in April 2016. He confessed to raping and killing Johnston after throwing her inside his horse trailer at the Sunshine Car Wash in Bethany on July 26, 1997. The newlywed was 19. He said he dumped her in tall grass off a dirt road. The mostly nude body was found the next day. He admitted to last killing Jessica Kane, 17, of Tiki Island, Texas. She disappeared after leaving a Bennigan's restaurant in Clear Lake, Texas, on August 17, 1997. Her vehicle was found abandoned along the interstate. Her remains were found on March 2016 at a dig site in Houston. Prosecutors alleged at trial that Reese targeted his victims to satisfy his sexual urges. They alleged he lied in his confessions and never revealed his true motive and all the details of each death. And so in a terrifying fashion we are left wondering what really happened to Tiffany Johnston at the hands of William Reese, Assistant District Attorney Ryan Stevenson told the judge Thursday. Evil is the best word that I can come up with, the prosecutor said. Johnston's mother, husband and other relatives sat in the jury box for the sentencing Thursday. Also in the courtroom were Smithers' parents and Cox's mother and daughter. Reese was born in Oklahoma but lived in Texas at the time of the killings. He drove trucks, operated a bulldozer and shoot horses for a living when he wasn't in prison. He was charged Tuesday with a new felony possession of contraband by an inmate. 
he is accused of having a smuggled pink cell phone in jail in July. We have made great strides to keep contraband out of the jail, the jail administrator, Craig Williams, said Wednesday. However, like in all corrections facilities, inmates will continue to seek ways to get a hold of contraband. We need to stay vigilant and alert in our efforts. William Reese is being held in Texas however he is under a death sentence in Oklahoma. Arthur Shawcross Eric Chris, a spokesman for the New York State Department of Correctional Services, told the Associated Press that Mr. Shawcross had been taken earlier on Monday from the Sullivan State Prison in Fallsburg, New York, to a hospital in Albany after complaining of leg pain. The cause of death was under investigation, he said. Mr. Shawcross was arrested on January 4, 1990, a day after the state police spotted him near the frozen body of one of his victims. In the previous 21 months, the bodies of many women nine of them prostitutes who had been working the streets of downtown Rochester had turned up along the banks of the Genesee River and in creeks, gorges, and remote wooded areas of country roads. At the time of his arrest, Mr. Shawcross was on parole after serving 15 years of a 25-year manslaughter sentence for the 1972 strangling of an 8-year-old girl in Watertown, New York. He had confessed to that killing, as well as to strangling a 10-year-old boy in Watertown. But he had not been prosecuted for killing the boy because law enforcement officials did not believe they had sufficient evidence. On December 13, 1990, after a 13-week trial and six hours of deliberation over a two-day period, a Monroe County jury convicted Mr. Shawcross on 10 counts of murder. It was one of the longest and most expensive trials in the county's history. Three months later, in neighboring Wayne County, Mr. Shawcross pleaded guilty to murdering another woman. Throughout his trial for the 10 killings, Mr. Shawcross, beefy and grain, sat virtually still, his shoulders sloped and his head down. In his pretrial confession, he had told investigators that for several years while being married, having an affair and often going fishing he also regularly patronized prostitutes he met in Rochester's Red Light District near Jones Park. He said he had killed one after she bit him, another for being too loud during intercourse, another for trying to steal his wallet, and a fourth for calling him a wimp. The jurors rejected the defense's claim that he was insane at the time of the killings because of brain damage, childhood abuse, and traumatic experiences as a soldier in Vietnam. Arthur J. Shawcross, a serial killer serving a 250-year sentence for strangling, suffocating, or beating to death 11 women in the Rochester area in the late 1980s, died on Monday. He was 63. Dennis Rader Rader was raised in Wichita, Kansas. He later claimed that as a youth he had killed animals and developed violent sexual fantasies that involved bondage. In the 1960s he served in the U.S. Air Force, and in 1970 he returned to Wichita, where he married and had two children. He held various jobs, including a brief stint as a factory worker for the Coleman Company, a maker of camping equipment. In 1979 he graduated from Wichita State University, where he studied criminal justice. During this time he began working for ADT, a home security company, and in 1991 he became a compliance officer in Park City, Kansas. Rader was active in his church, and he served as a Boy Scout leader. On January 15, 1974, Rader committed his first murders, strangling four family members, including two children, in their Wichita home, the mother had worked for Coleman. Seaman was found at the scene, though none of the victims had been sexually assaulted. Rader took a watch from the home, and he would acquire souvenirs, often underwear, from subsequent victims. In April 1974 Rader targeted a 21-year-old woman who was another Coleman employee. After breaking into her house, however, he also encountered her brother, who managed to escape despite being shot. Rader fatally stabbed the woman before fleeing. Later that year he wrote a letter detailing the January murders and saying that the code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. He left the note in a book at the Wichita Public Library, and it was eventually recovered by the police. Over the next two decades, Rader killed five more women. His sixth victim was strangled in March 1977 after he locked her three young children in the bathroom. Following the death of his next victim in December 1977, 
Raider grew irritated by the lack of media coverage. In a letter to a local TV station, he wrote, How many people do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? The resulting coverage helped set off a panic. Raider then waited eight years before murdering a neighbor in her home in 1985. He reportedly later took her body to his church, where he photographed her in bondage. A 28-year-old mother of two was killed in 1986, and in 1991 Raider committed his last murder, strangling a 62-year-old woman in her secluded home. The cases subsequently went cold. In 2004, on the 30th anniversary of Raider's first murders, a local paper ran a feature in which it speculated that the killer had either died or been imprisoned. Raider responded by sending various evidence from his ninth murder, notably a copy of the victim's driver's license as well as photographs of her body, to a reporter. For the next year, he sent packages to the media or simply left items around Wichita. He often used cereal boxes, possibly a reference to serial killer, to hold drawings, crime souvenirs, including photographs, written descriptions of the murders, and even dolls, posed to mimic the various deaths. In January 2005 police received a break after recovering a cereal box that included a note in which Raider asked police whether they would be able to trace a floppy disk he wanted to send them. Through a classified ad, law enforcement officials indicated that it would be safe. He then sent them a disk, which the police quickly traced to his church, where he served as president of the congregation. Raider's DNA was then matched to the semen found at the first crime scene. He was arrested in February 2005, and he soon confessed to the crimes and expressed shock that the police had lied to him. In June Raider pled guilty, and two months later he was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms. Alfredo Prieto Alfredo Rolando Prieto was executed by the state of Virginia on Thursday, October 1, 2015. He was pronounced dead at 9.17 p.m. at the Greenville Correctional Center in Jarrett, Virginia. Alfredo was 49 years of age. Alfredo was executed for the rape and murder of 22-year-old Rachel A. Raver and the murder of 22-year-old Warren H. Fulton III. They were last seen alive on December 4, 1988. Their bodies were discovered two days later in Fairfax, Virginia. Alfredo has spent the last seven years of his life on Virginia's death row. Alfredo was born and spent part of his childhood in El Salvador, which was in the midst of a civil war. By the time Alfredo was a teenager, he and his family were living in California, where Alfredo became a member of the Pomona Northside Gang. On December 4, 1988, two Georgetown University students, Rachel Raver, and Warren Fulton were seen leaving a local restaurant in Washington, D.C. Two days later, their bodies were discovered in a deserted area near Reston, Virginia. Investigators determined that Warren was shot in the back of the head and Rachel was shot while trying to escape. As she lay bleeding to death, Prieto raped her. Prieto then fled to California. In 1990, 15-year-old Yvette Woodruff was raped and murdered in Ontario, California. Prieto was charged and convicted of her murder. He then received a death sentence in 1992. While in prison in California, Prieto's DNA was entered into a national database. In 2005, his DNA was matched to a cold case in Virginia, the rape and murder of Rachel and the murder of Warren. Prieto was extradited to Virginia to stand trial. He was convicted and given two death sentences, along with various prison terms for charges related to the murders. Through DNA evidence, Prieto has also been linked to the rape and murder of 24-year-old Veronica Tina Jefferson in Arlington, Virginia in May of 1988, the murder of 27-year-old Manuel F. Sermino in Prince William County, Virginia in September of 1989, the rape and murder of 19-year-old Stacy Segrist and the murder of 21-year-old Tony Januzzi in Riverside County, California in the spring of 1990, and the murder of 71-year-old Lula Farley and 65-year-old Herbert Farley, which also occurred. In the spring of 1990, in Riverside County, California, ballistic evidence is also linked to several of the crimes. Clifford Olson Serial child killer Clifford Olson, who pleaded guilty to murdering 11 children in 1982, is dead. Relatives of his victims greeted the news with quiet relief and emotion, 
finally delivered from having to face the weight of Olsen's psychopathy every time the man made news even from prison. I don't have to think about it anymore. About him, anyway, said a subdued Raymond King, whose 15-year-old son was killed by Olsen. He's never going to pop up in our lives again. He's never going to open those wounds again. It's done. It's over. Now it's time for me. Serge Virgil, the Quebec region spokesman for the Correctional Service of Canada, said Olsen died at the Archambault Hospital Centre, which is part of the prison complex where he had been an inmate. He was at the Regional Reception Centre which is a multi-level federal penitentiary in St. Anne's de Plaines, Quebec and at the time of his death he was at the institution's healthcare centre which is attached to the jail itself, a Virgil told the Canadian press. He said any burial service will be kept low-key. In a case that is notorious like this, there will come a point where the funeral will happen and it's likely that it will be at an undisclosed location and so the public will not be made aware of the whereabouts, a Virgil said. Olsen, the 71-year-old whose name has been repeatedly invoked over the decades by those who supported bringing back the death penalty in Canada, died of cancer. These are tears of happiness because justice is done for the children, said an emotional Trudy Court, the sister of one of Olsen's victims. Our justice system couldn't do it for them. But life has. He's gone now. Olsen's victims were all between 9 and 18 years old. Declared a dangerous offender, Olsen had often described himself as the beast of British Columbia. He spent 30 years behind bars, but his incarceration did not keep him out of the headlines. In fact, his notoriety was such that it often led to changes in Canadian law. Among the changes, were restrictions on early parole for murderers and the eventual elimination of the Faint Hope Clause, the denial of federal pensions to certain prisoners and increased time between parole hearings for multiple murderers. His case also spurred on the victims' rights movement and the creation of a police tracking system for violent crimes. It was Christmas Day 1980 when the body of 12-year-old Christine Weller was found, strangled and stabbed. The young girl from Surrey, B.C., was the first of his 11 known victims. He reportedly lured them with the promise of a job and then plied them with alcohol and drugs. He tortured them, sexually assaulted them, killed them and then dumped their bodies. Olsen became a suspect early in the police investigation. He had been a juvenile delinquent and had spent all but five years of his adult life in prison. His fellow inmates had tried to kill him. However, police later claimed they didn't have enough resources to keep tabs on him as he drove thousands of kilometers around BC in rental cars. Olsen's arrest on August 12, 1981, ended the killing spree. Before he pleaded guilty in 1982, Olsen struck a notorious cash-for-bodies deal with police. His wife received $100,000 after Clifford Olsen led investigators to the bodies. The deal angered many of the victims' families, who felt Olsen had profited from their tragic losses. Olsen was sentenced to life in prison, but being behind bars didn't stop his ability to terrorize. That's how Gary Rosenfeld, who died in 2009, once described what happened to his family. His 16-year-old stepson, Darren Johnsrud, was Olsen's third victim. In the spring of 1981, Johnsrud ran an errand for his mother, Sharon Rosenfeld, to the corner store near his home in Coquitlam, B.C. His body was found a month later, the teen had been sexually assaulted. After his stepson's death, the Rosenfelts launched a group called Victims of Violence. A few years later, in 1986, Olsen wrote a letter to Rosenfeld describing John's Roots ordeal. He described in detail exactly what he did to our son, Rosenfeld said. Clifford Olson also wrote book manuscripts and was allowed to make a series of videotapes in prison. In them, he described what he did to his victims, including driving nails into their heads and asking them how it felt. For the Rosenfeld there were also problems with the justice system. We feel strongly that had justice worked in the manner it was supposed to work, 30 years ago, Clifford Olson would have been in jail serving time for other sex crimes that went unattended, that were stayed by the courts, and I feel that the justice system helped create the monster that he became and my son paid for this with his life," Sharon told the CBC's Mark Kelly in 2011. In 1989, 
while testifying in an inquest into an inmate's suicide at Kingston Penitentiary, Olson said God had forgiven him for his murders. I've asked for forgiveness, I've been forgiven and that's the end of it. In August 1997, after serving 15 years of his sentence, Olson appeared in a Surrey courtroom asking for an early parole hearing. For four days, the court heard victim impact statements. The likelihood of Olson's release was slim, it took the jury 15 minutes to reject Olson's request for parole. However, in those days, Olson had a right to apply for an early parole hearing under Sector 745 of the Criminal Code, the so-called Faint Hope Clause. The clause dates back to 1976, when Parliament scrapped the death penalty and added a parole hearing for inmates that had served 15 years of a sentence. The clause was seen as an incentive for good behavior, affording prisoners a parole hearing before they serve 25 years, when a parole hearing is mandatory. The controversy surrounding Olson's request, and the anguish it caused for his victims' families, sparked a campaign to have the clause erased. Days after his 1997 parole hearing, the families and others opposed to the clause staged a demonstration in BC. The law was eventually amended to exclude serial killers like Olson. And for other killers, such hearings were no longer automatic. A judge would screen the applications, and juries would have to be unanimous before a murderer's parole ineligibility period could be shortened. In April 2006, the newly elected Harper government promised to get rid of the Faint Hope Clause and it was finally repealed in 2011, when the Serious Time for the Most Serious Crime Act received royal assent. Olson was the last multiple murderer in Canada to be allowed to ask for early parole. Convicted killers have the right to apply for a hearing after serving 25 years, so on July 18, 2006, Olson was again in front of a jury asking for parole. Three of the families came to the hearing in Montreal to present victim impact statements. However, the session was suspended before the jury made its decision. Before the break, Olson said he wasn't applying for parole and the board had no jurisdiction over him. I will be staying in my cell, he said. I won't be coming back to hear your retarded decision. During the hearing, Olson made bizarre statements. He told the three-member panel he intended to leave the country because he had reached a deal with the U.S. Attorney General in exchange for information related to 9-11. Journalist Peter Worthington, who had periodic contact with Olson since about 1989, said the convicted killer could be lucid and introspective about his crimes, then would switch to unrelated topics. But, he said, Olson was usually in control of the conversation. He knows right from wrong, he just doesn't care, Worthington told CBC News in 2006. Everything is a kind of learned behavior. He's a good con man and he manipulates. According to National Parole Board member Jacques Latendre, Olson presents a high risk and a psychopathic risk. He is a sexual sadist and a narcissist. If released, he will kill again. As expected, Olson was denied parole. In 2010 Olson boasted to Worthington that he had been receiving old age security payments since he turned 65, five years earlier. He was also entitled to the Guaranteed Income Supplement. The news angered the government, which introduced legislation to end pension payments to some federal prisoners. The act became law at the beginning of 2011. In November 2010, Olson had another parole hearing and was turned down. Family members of Olson's victims had been complaining that killers like Olson could have a hearing every two years, each time requiring them to relive the original ordeal. They had been calling for changes to the law, so that the families don't have to go through this grief and aggravation every two years, Michael Massing, whose daughter was murdered by Olson, said at the time. The federal government agreed and once again had legislation before Parliament to change the law. In March, legislation that increases the time between parole hearings for multiple murderers like Olson received royal assent. For Sharon Rosenfeld, the changes to the law have been the emotional healing that we have been able to derive from this nightmare. However, she then told the CBC's Mark Kelly, there is no closure. There is a different way of living, but there is no closure. It's an open wound that goes on and on. Manuel Pardo Jr. A former police officer who murdered nine people during a 1986 crime spree was executed Tuesday after his attorney's last-minute appeals were rejected. 
Manuel Pardo, 56, was pronounced dead at Florida State Prison at 7.47 p.m., about 16 minutes after the lethal injection process began. His attorneys had tried to block the execution by arguing that he was mentally ill, but federal courts declined to intercede. Reporters could not hear his final statement because of an apparent malfunction in the death chamber's sound system. A white sheet had been pulled up to his chin and four lines ran into his left arm. He blinked several times, his eyes moved back and forth and he took several deep breaths. Over the next several minutes the color drained from his face before he was pronounced dead. Prison officials said his final words were, airborne forever. I love you, Michi baby, referring to his daughter. Manuel Pardo also wrote a final statement that was distributed to the media, in which he claimed that he never killed any women, but accepted full responsibility for killing six men. I never harmed those three women or any female. I took the blame as I knew I was doomed and it made no difference to me, at this time, having six or nine death sentences, he wrote on December 11th, hours before his execution. I don't want this hanging over my head, especially these last few minutes of life, because my war was against men who were trafficking, sick, in narcotics and no one else. Officials said most of Pardo's victims were involved with drugs. Pardo contended that he was doing the world a favor by killing them over three-month period in early 1986. I am a soldier, I accomplished my mission and I humbly ask you to give me the glory of ending my life and not send me to spend the rest of my days in state prison, Pardo told jurors at his 1988 trial. Frank Judd, the nephew of victim Farah Quintero read a statement following the execution, which was witnessed by fewer than 10 family members of the victims. Judd thanked the state of Florida for bringing closure to his family and said the pain he and his relatives feel about the murder of Quintero continues to this day. Personally, I don't feel that what happened today was enough justice, he said, adding that Pardo was a disturbed soul. Pardo's final letter apologized to his family for the pain and grief he caused. You all are so loving and wonderful, not deserving of this nightmare, he wrote. He asked his family to please not suffer and to be strong. He mentioned his daughter Michi in the written statement. Remember Michi you are airborne and hardcore, no tears, he wrote. Manuel Pardo also touched on his love of sports, devoting one of three paragraphs in his letter to baseball, soccer and bullfighting. On a lighter note, as a New Yorker and loyal fan, I was happy to see my Yankees and Giants win so many championships during my lifetime, Pardo wrote. He said it was a lifelong dream to see Spain win the World Cup and urge the Spanish government to never stop bullfights because they are a part of our culture and heritage. And if they do, I'm glad I won't be alive to see such a travesty. Anne Howard, a spokeswoman for Florida's Department of Corrections, said that Pardo visited with eight people Tuesday. He also met with the prison chaplain and a Roman Catholic bishop. Manuel Pardo ate a last meal of rice, red beans, roasted pork, plantains, avocado, tomatoes, and olive oil. For dessert, he ate pumpkin pie and drank eggnog and Cuban coffee. Under Department of Corrections rules, the meal's ingredients have to cost $40 or less, be available locally and made in the prison kitchen. Manuel Pardo was dubbed the Death Row Romeo after he corresponded with dozens of women and persuaded many to send him money. The former Boy Scout and Navy veteran began his law enforcement career in the 1970s with the Florida Highway Patrol, graduating at the top of his class at the Academy. But he was fired from that agency in 1979 for falsifying traffic tickets. He was soon hired by the police department in Sweetwater, a small city in Miami-Dade County. In 1981, Pardo was one of four Sweetwater officers charged with brutality, but the cases were dismissed. He was fired four years later after he flew to the Bahamas to testify at the trial of a Sweetwater colleague who was accused of drug smuggling. Pardo lied, telling the court they were international undercover agents. Then over a 92-day period in early 1986, Pardo committed a series of robberies, killing six men and three women. He took photos of the victims and recounted some details in his diary, which was found along with newspaper clippings about the murders. Pardo was linked to the killings after using credit cards stolen from the victims. Craig Price 
A Florida judge on Friday sentenced infamous serial killer Craig Price, who terrorized Warwick in the 1980s, to serve 25 years in prison for trying to murder a fellow inmate. Price, 45, agreed to plead guilty to a charge that he stabbed inmate Joshua Davis with a homemade, 5-inch knife blade at the Sewanee Correctional Institution, according to the Sewanee County Clerk of the Circuit Court's office. He received a 25-year sentence on that charge, plus 10 years probation, according to Assistant State Attorney Sandra L. Rosendale. Craig received 10 years probation for possession of contraband. The probation terms are concurrent, but will be served consecutively to his prison sentence, Rosendale said. Price agreed to a 524 days of good time credit, the clerk's office said. If Price violates his probation upon his release, he could be sent back to prison to serve a sentence up to life, Rosendale wrote in an email. Price agreed to be classified as a habitual felony offender. Rhode Island prosecutors praised the resolution of the case. We are extremely grateful for the excellent work by the Third Judicial Circuit of Florida State Attorney's Office on this case, Christy Dosries, spokeswoman for Attorney General Peter F. Neronia's office, said in an email statement. It has been clear from the beginning that our Florida colleagues knew how significant this case was to Rhode Island. We are also grateful that, for purposes of public safety, Mr. Price has been sentenced to a long sentence based on his latest acts of violent criminal misconduct. Price's lawyer, Michael Bryant, declined comment. Documents indicate that Price entered Davis's cell on April 4, 2017, and repeatedly stabbed him. Davis fled, but Price tackled him and continued the attack. Authorities say the premeditated assault was caught on video and that Price intended to inflict mortal wounds. Price was arraigned in August 2017, but had refused to enter a plea, instead reserving his right to challenge the legal sufficiency of the charging document, prosecutors said. His trial was repeatedly delayed and, in November, his lawyer sought to get a competency assessment. Craig is perhaps Rhode Island's most notorious criminal. In 1989, at age 15, he admitted to stabbing and bludgeoning his neighbors Joan Heaton and her daughters, Melissa and Jennifer, in the Buttonwoods neighborhood of Warwick. He also admitted to committing the unsolved murder of another neighbor, Rebecca Spencer, two years earlier, when he was 13. Under state law at the time, Price could not be tried and sentenced as an adult, meaning he would have been released from juvenile detention at age 21. He has since been held on a raft of charges, including contempt of court and assault on correctional officers in Rhode Island. Price's Rhode Island sentence ran out in October 2017, according to the State Department of Corrections. The Rhode Island Attorney General's office filed a probation violation petition against Price related to a previous Florida assault, a spokeswoman there has said. Craig Price is currently incarcerated at Florida State Prison. Kelly Cochran Kelly Marie Cochran, 34, stands accused of helping her husband kill and dismember her boyfriend. She is also charged with killing her husband to even the score, and the prosecuting attorney thinks her body count may not stop there. According to reports, on October 13, 2014, Cochran and her husband, 37-year-old Jason Cochran, came up with a diabolical plan. The next night, Cochran would lure 53-year-old Christopher Reagan, Kelly's co-worker and boyfriend, to her home with the promise of sex and Jason would kill him. The plan worked, and when Jason caught Reagan with his wife, he shot him in the head with a .22 caliber long barrel shotgun. The Cochrans then set about dismembering Reagan's body. Kelly later admitted to getting a cord for an electric handsaw, known colloquially as a sawzall, so Jason Cochran could cut up his corpse. They then divided Reagan's body between garbage bags and threw the bags into the woods around the Iron River in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Reagan was reported missing a few days later and his car was found abandoned at a park and ride lot four miles east of Iron River, Michigan. According to the local Daily News, police honed in on Cochran because she was one of the last people to see Rakin. When police searched her home with the FBI in March 2015, they found nothing, but Cochran was spooked and she and her husband packed up and moved to Lake County, Indiana. Police continued their investigation with Kelly listed a person of interest, but a year passed and still they had nothing. 
Then, in February 2016, Jason died of an apparent heroin overdose. Kelly held a memorial service, writing on Facebook that his death was the hardest thing I will ever have to deal with. But police weren't buying it. Nine weeks after Jason died, Michigan authorities charged Kelly Cochran with Reagan's death, and she fled Indiana. The U.S. Marshals Service eventually tracked her down in Kentucky, where she was arrested on April 28 and taken into custody. According to court documents, she spent her time in her jail cell turning her glasses into shanks and threatening violence against anyone who came near her. She was extradited to Michigan where she is now in custody awaiting trial. Following her arrest, Cochran was interrogated by both Michigan and Indiana police for almost 70 hours. According to the Northwest Indiana Post-Tribune, she was able to direct investigators to a desolate stretch of Michigan woods where they discovered evidence of Cochran's alleged crimes, including a human skull with an apparent bullet hull, bones and bone fragments. Police also recovered a .22 caliber rifle, a .22 caliber bullet, and a pair of glasses at the scene. While Cochran was in custody, police also questioned her about the death of her husband. They had grown suspicious when Cochran's version of what happened the night that Jason Cochran died kept changing. Paramedics had been called to the house that Cochran shared with her husband in February, but the EMTs found Jason unresponsive and were unable to revive him. At first glance it looked like he had died of a heroin overdose, but the Indiana Lake County coroner discovered that Jason had actually died from asphyxiation, not heroin. That's when suspicion turned to his wife who had been disruptive while EMT were working on her husband's body. The post tribune reports Cochran told police that she delivered an overdose of heroin to her husband and proceeded to put her hands on his neck, nose, and mouth until he died less than a minute later. In an interview with detectives in Hobart, Indiana, Cochran finally gave police a motive for her brutal crimes, her decade-plus marriage needed saving. According to the post tribune, Cochran told police that the night before the murder, she and her husband had argued, perhaps about Rakin, and her husband wanted to know how she was going to fix things. The answer they stumbled on, apparently, was to kill Rakin. In interviews, Cochran said she blamed her husband for Rakin's death and for taking the only good thing I had in my life. The post tricky notes that in court records Cochran said, I still hate him, her husband, and yes, it was revenge. I even the score. There was a brief moment before Reagan's death, she had reportedly considered killing her husband instead of her boyfriend. Instead, she ended up killing them both, waiting 16 months to exact her revenge on her husband. In Indiana, Cochran has been charged with the death of her husband. In Michigan, she faces charges related to Reagan's death, including homicide, assisting her husband to mutilate, deface, remove or carry away a portion of a dead body and concealing the death of an individual. Cochran pleaded not guilty to all the charges. While she initially claimed that she wanted to defend herself, she eventually relented and asked for assistance from a public defender. While Cochran is charged with two murders, Iron County prosecuting attorney Melissa Powell thinks there may be more bodies buried in Cochran's past. According to her court filings, Cochran has claimed responsibility for the deaths of other individuals, which, if true, make her a serial killer. While it's unclear what other deaths Cochran may be talking about, Powell appears to be taking the statement seriously enough to question Cochran's mental health. Before Powell can launch an investigation into Cochran's claims, she has to prove that Cochran is competent. Iron County District Court Judge C. Joseph Schwedler agreed and has ordered a forensic examination of Cochran to determine both mental competency and criminal responsibility. According to Powell's filings, Cochran has a long history of mental illness, including a voluntary admission to a psychiatric hospital in Indiana and suicidal ideation. Cochran has written her family goodbye letters and has threatened to commit suicide while incarcerated as well as threatened bodily harm against any persons whom she may have contact with while incarcerated. Until the forensic examination can determine her competency, which the judge has asked to expedite, Cochran remains in the Iron County Jail on a $5 million cash bond. Thomas Eugene Thomas Eugene Creech, and he's been on death row in Idaho for over 37 years now for the murder of prison inmate David Dale Jensen on May 13, 1981,
but that isn't the only murder Creech is convicted of committing and it isn't the only time Creech was sentenced to death row. He was sentenced to death again in 2019. I do not know why all this delay in the implementation of the penalty. Since that time, I have not obtained confirmed information about whether he was executed, died in prison, or is still imprisoned. If you have confirmed information, tell us in the comments. At the time of the murder of David Dale Jensen in 1981, Jensen and Creech were both inmates housed inside the maximum security prison at Idaho's penitentiary. Creech was serving time for two murder convictions in Idaho. He was convinced to attack and did in fact murder David Jensen, a 22 or 23-year-old young man who was in prison as a car thief, said Jim Harris, former Ada County prosecutor who asked for the death penalty against Creech in 1982. According to court documents, Jensen was partially disabled. Years earlier, in an attempted suicide, he shot himself in the head, resulting in the removal of part of his brain and a plastic plate being placed in his skull, causing impaired speech and motor functions. Court documents say he and Thomas Creech were not on good terms. Creech was a janitor at the penitentiary at the time, and court documents say Creech and Jensen had argued about Jensen dirtying the floor, something Creech had to clean up. Because of his janitorial duties, Thomas Creech was the only prisoner who could be out of his cell at the same time as another inmate. Both Chuck Palmer and I wrote letters to the penitentiary warden during that time frame, once he was released, warning the warden in the penitentiary system that this was a very dangerous criminal, said Harris. Chuck Palmer was the Ada County Sheriff at the time. He and Jim Harris, Ada County prosecuting attorney in 1981, both believed that if Creech were given the opportunity to kill, even while in prison, he would act on it. That's what happened on May 13th of 1981. David Dale Jensen was released from his cell for an hour to exercise and shower. Jensen had other plans during that time though. Court documents say David Dale Jensen attacked Thomas Creech with a sock filled with batteries. Creech was able to take the weapon away from Jensen, and it was that same weapon Creech would later use to beat Jensen to death. In an exclusive letter to us from Creech he admits to that, again, yes, I killed that guy. But he attacked me, wrote Creech. Creech went on to claim self-defense in the incident, but prosecution argued he went above and beyond self-defense. Following that murder in 1981, Creech was handed the death penalty sentence in 1983 for the second time in his life. You see, that wasn't his first murder. His criminal history started at the age of 16, said Harris. Former Ada County prosecutor Jim Harris said Creech spoke to him about his childhood. I think it was potentially the loss of his father at a very young age particularly since the man essentially died in his arms. His first enemy. His first attempted murder was the male nurse that failed to get help to his father before he died, said Harris. The Journal News out of Hamilton, Ohio wrote that Creech claimed he committed his first murder at the age of 17 by drowning a friend in New Miami who he believed was responsible for the traffic death of his girlfriend. The paper also stated Creech claimed to have killed five people from a motorcycle gang in Ohio for satanic cult worship rituals. In a United Press International article from 1986, writer Steve Crean reported that Creech ran away from home and claims to have killed a man in San Francisco in 1965. During that time in San Francisco, sources say Thomas Creech became involved with the Church of Satan before it was officially organized in 1969. In 1973 Creech married Thomasine Loren White. That same year both of them were wanted in connection of the murder of Paul C. Schrader in Tucson, Arizona. The Tucson Daily Citizen paper reported on January 4, 1974 that Paul C. Schrader was stabbed to death at the downtown Motor Hotel in Tucson, Arizona. Creech was arrested for the murder in Beaver, Utah and taken back to Arizona to face charges, but after hours of deliberation, 23-year-old Creech was acquitted of the Tucson murder. In 1974, Creech and his wife, Thomasine, moved to Portland. A United Press International article stated that Thomas Creech spent some time in the Oregon Psychiatric Hospital in Salem. After he was released, he moved into the Street Marks Episcopal Church in Portland and began work as their resident maintenance worker. 
In the exclusive letter Creech sent to us, he said his wife Thomasine was raped by 11 men and tossed out a window four stories high that left her paralyzed and damaged mentally, wrote Creech. She later died by suicide in the Oregon State Hospital. His letter to us also stated that he killed some of the men who allegedly raped his wife. Also in 1974, Creech was convicted of killing 22-year-old William Joseph Dean. An article from the United Press International stated that Dean's body was found in Creech's living quarters inside the St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Portland. And later that same year, two traveling painters were found shot to death in Idaho. Authorities say Thomas Creech and his girlfriend Carol Spaulding were hitchhiking from Lewiston to Donnelly, Idaho when two men by the name of Edward T. Arnold and John Wayne Bradford picked them up in their 1956 Buick. Thomas shot John and Edward then partially buried their bodies off Highway 55 in Donnelly. The judge in the case, J. Ray Dertsky, said Creech denied killing the two in Idaho in court, but admitted to being a mass murderer. Judge Dertsky recorded his recollection of Creech's original 1975 trial in an audio recording for the Idaho Historical Society before his passing. It was verified that they did find some of the bodies that he identified before them and showed them where they was. That was his defense in my case. He says my goodness I'm admitting I killed all these other people. I wouldn't deny this if I had done it, said Judge Dertsky. A statement from the Idaho Supreme Court noted, Creech has admitted to killing or participating in the killing of at least 26 people. The bodies of 11 of his victims who were shot, stabbed, beaten, or strangled to death have been recovered in seven states. And former Ada County Prosecutor Jim Harris said, they found a large number of skeletons that Tom lead them to in a mine shaft in California. Judge J. Ray Dertsky also made this statement inside the courthouse in Wallace, Idaho. Law enforcement officers were worried about him in the trial. Worried about security because of all the rumors getting around that he had been a member of the Hells Angels and they were going to come up her and break him out. And I moved him up to Wallace to try him where there had not been any publicity. Judge Dertsky found Creech guilty of the Donnelly murders and sentenced him to hang in March of 1976. At that time, Idaho's law stated a first-degree murder charge was a mandatory death sentence. That law was later ruled unconstitutional by the Idaho Supreme Court in 1979, and Creech was sentenced to life in prison. That didn't sit well with Sheriff Palmer or Prosecutor Jim Harris. In our opinion Creech was a psychotic and he didn't like inmates and he would probably kill someone if they didn't supervise him very closely around other inmates. It was a short time after that Creech was allowed trustee status and given full run of several sections of maximum security as a janitor, said Harris. That statement was almost a foreshadow of what was to come a mere two years later when Thomas Creech killed again. The prosecution quoted the statement made by Creech in court, and okay. I kicked him a couple more times and he was laying there bleeding real bad and breathing real funny. By 1982 Thomas Creech was convicted for the murder of David Dale Jensen and he was back on death row. Then, just a few years later Creech filed a writ of habeas corpus. And in the midst of appeals, former Ada County Deputy Prosecutor Roger Bourne made this statement in court in 1995, if the death penalty doesn't fit this defendant. Who does it fit? This defendant is a mass murderer. He has shown extreme violence while in the penitentiary. If the legislature didn't intend it to fit this defendant, who could it fit any better? This is where today's stories end. As we conclude our exploration into the lesser-known serial killers of the past, we are reminded that darkness can manifest in the most unexpected corners of society. These forgotten stories serve as a stark reminder that vigilance and empathy are essential tools in understanding the human psyche. Join us again for more chilling tales and hidden truths as we continue to unravel the mysteries that history has cast aside. Thank you for joining us on this unsettling but essential journey into the obscure chronicles of serial killers.